Welcome to Pushback. I'm Aaron Maté. Joining me is Richard Sakwa. He is professor of Russian and European politics at the University of Kent. His books include Frontline Ukraine, Crisis in the Borderlands, and his latest, Deception, Russiagate, and the New Cold War. Professor Sakwa, thank you once again for joining me. My pleasure. As we are speaking, Vladimir Putin has just announced that he is going to be recognizing these two breakaway republics in the Donbass of Ukraine. Germany has responded that they are pausing the certification of the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline between Russia and Germany. Your reaction to these developments? Well, it's the game changer, even though the game doesn't change. It's a major step. Uh, and, you know, depending on how the players are going to take it forwards. Uh, in terms of the recognition of these two uh, so-called people's republics, it's uh, prompted in part by Putin's frustration that uh, the various ideas about a European security treaty, which he put forwards on the 17th of December, then he got the US and NATO response, and Russia a few days ago responded uh, to them with a tone of disappointment, and that brought matters to a head. Uh, but also another factor behind it is uh, the fact that Russia has been sanctioned nonstop since 2015 for its failure to implement the Minsk Accords. And yet almost no pressure was put on Kiev to fulfill its part of trying to solve the Minsk Accords. And the Minsk Agreement was, we people forget, was about how to return these two so-called separatist or breakaway parts to Ukrainian sovereignty. That was the point. And so Russia was actually trying to push these people back into Ukraine, but they refused to you know, fulfill their bit. The Normandy format was one way to achieve it. Uh, and that wasn't being fulfilled. Um, so that's an immediate and a third and final, just immediate, plenty more. But the biggest one big issue is that we tend to forget that the nearly four million people living in the Donbass uh, have been suffering, uh, you know, shelling and sniper fire and, you know, deprivations of one for another for you know, nearly seven years now. Uh, and, you know, this really has been quite important. If you recall that terrible time when Sarajevo was under siege from 1992 to 1995 by the Serbs, uh, and, and quite rightly so, there was an international reaction. But it almost seems as if these four million people just don't matter, that they're Sovox or Vatniki, you know, these unpleasant uh, derogatory terms or what Hillary Clinton would call a basket of deplorables. So, uh, and, and they're not, you know, 700,000 of them now have Russian passports. These are men, women and children trying to live a normal life. And it just wasn't, imp wasn't possible. So um, this is an attempt to break the logjam. Whether it's the right move or not <laughs> is debatable, but that's what the goal, the aim is. On this point, the Russian ambassador to the UN, Vasily Nebenzaya, said at a meeting, a late night meeting of the UN Security Council, he said this, the main task of our decision in terms of recognizing the independence of these republics in the Donbass was to preserve and protect the, these lives of the civilians there. This is more important than all of your threats. Do you think that's true, that this was the main motivator here for Russia to protect uh, people in the Donbass who have been uh, on the receiving end of Ukrainian military shelling. And maybe you could put some numbers to this. Are there any verifiable numbers uh, that show, you know, just who's been bearing the brunt of this war in the Donbass between rebels and the Ukrainian military? To start on that second point, uh, according to UN data, 80% uh, of the uh, military um, actions. I mean, it's difficult. Sometimes it's, it's very questionable the OSE mission where an actual shell has emerged from. But basically, 80% of the incidents originated from Ukraine side into the Donbass, and 80% of the casualties have been on the Donbass side, which is quite frightening and awful. And as for to say the main motivation, uh, maybe it wasn't the main. But certainly it was important. And, you know, it's been a matter of increasing concern. I mean, I've been in meetings, uh, you know, in Moscow with high officials where we've had uh, people from the Donbass who, you know, saying, look, come on, help us do something to stop this endless shelling. And it's really quite disgraceful for the Euro European Union. I mean, I don't know about the United States, but certainly the EU, which claims to uphold uh, norms and human rights. And it seems to have ignored entirely the, the lives and the conditions of nearly four million people. It's yet another you know, abnegation of uh, our response world or what some people would call double standards. On the point about double standards, you mentioned uh, the Ukrainian government's hesitancy to implement the Minsk II Accords, which would 
which could resolve the conflict. The Washington Post recently reported on the most recent round of talks that were held to revive the Minsk Accords, brokered by France and Germany, I believe. And this is what the Washington Post reported. A key obstacle, according to diplomats familiar with the discussion, was Kiev's opposition to negotiating with the pro-Russian separatists with whom they've been in a deadly but low intensity conflict for the past eight years. This was just reported last week. So you have a, the Kiev government apparently here saying that they will not negotiate with the people that they're fighting in the Donbass, which essentially makes negotiations impossible. Do you think that this was then a deliberate strategy on their part to ensure that Minsk would fail? And do you think that the U.S. had a role in encouraging them towards that position? Well, uh, Kiev has been adopting this position for seven years, effectively. It, it has refused to talk to the people, its own people, by the way, on the other side. They would, have, they would argue that they were simply Moscow stooges and so on. Um, clearly, they were um, influenced by Moscow and some of the leadership was changed. But nevertheless, you know, when we have an insurgency, uh, and we know this going back or any counterinsurgency operation, in the end, you have to talk to the people you know not like them, but you, like I mean, all the way, you can talk Nelson Mandela, for example, um, all the way back, not suggesting any comparable terms. So uh, the you have to talk. And but Minsk has refused to talk to their own people. In fact, they launched uh, a various, you know, the attack in um, April 2014, when there had been a Geneva agreement on the 17th of April that year. And it was Kiev which refused and started the shelling and so-called ATO, uh, anti-terrorist organ uh, operation, against its own people. And this has been the astonishing thing for so long, a people which they want to return to Ukrainian sovereignty. So a paradox here. And it, it was a nonsense, ultimately. Uh, a very cool one. Um, and so, as you say, there wasn't a feeling a couple of weeks ago that the Normandy format, that's France, Germany, Russia and Ukraine, would um, start and get the thing moving. But the feeling at that moment was that we probably needed the United States on board to push Kiev towards an agreement. I can understand Kiev's reservations because uh, clearly um, some sort of autonomy for the Donbass would have jeopardised its uh, joining NATO. But then even then, you know, joining NATO, why it wasn't likely to be in the near future anyway. So it was uh, clearly an untenable position. It's a Gordian knot, which this act last night of recognition of their independence is an attempt to cut. But as we know with Gordian knots, when you cut one knot, you create another one. How influential is the far right in Ukraine in blocking implementation of Accords like Minsk and any other kind of resolution that could end the fighting. Well, it's uh, basically they, they hold veto power, uh, and we saw this in December 2019. Uh, we'll remember that Vladimir uh, Zelensky was elected president of Ukraine in April 2019 with over 70 percent of the population. The vote, including, I mean, he's a Russian speaker uh, from the southeast, um, were in favor as the peace candidate. A peace candidate, just like, by the way, Poroshenko was elected president in May 2014 as the peace candidate. But in both cases, they were held hostage by the militant nationalists and radicals, call them what you like. And at the meeting in Paris, December 2019, of the Normandy format, which we really thought and Putin went out of his way to try to achieve a result. And so did Merkel and uh, the French president Macron, by the way. Uh, but even as they were meeting uh, in that Normandy format, the militants were occupying the Maidan and saying, we won't allow any agreement. Zelensky tried um, afterwards to keep pushing it forwards with his chief of staff. Uh, but basically, they hold the Ukrainian state hostage, uh, which is a catastrophic position. And that's why uh, Putin felt um, he had to go over their heads to try to achieve an agreement, which ultimately has to be with the United States. What did you make of Putin's speech? He gave a very long address in announcing the recognition of these two republics. He listed a series of historical grievances. And the way it's being interpreted in the U.S. is that this was Putin announcing that essentially the era of uh, uh, peace or cooperation or, or negotiations with the West is over and that Putin is now trying to basically reconstitute the Soviet empire with these two breakaway republics inside Ukraine being just the first stop. 
this uh, version, which is put forward by Kiev and its vast army of lobbyists in Washington, uh, is completely false. Um, Putin never has any intention of re-establishing a Russian empire, an old Soviet or Russian imperial framework. What he wants, indeed, um, the Min that's why he supported, against huge opposition, by the way, internally, uh, the Minsk Accords for so long, uh, was because he felt there could be a way forwards. But yes, um, the speech last night was a deeply emotional one. I've actually never quite seen him like that. I, I've I watched Putin dozens and dozens of times close up, far away on screens and so on. But it was almost like a sort of a suppressed anger and he, he was almost on the edge of losing control. People tell me that the last time he was quite like this was after the what Moscow calls the coup, uh, when Yanukovych was overthrown uh, on the 20, 20, well, 21st of February 2014, that he, he really did lose control. Uh, and then they moved towards uh, Crimea. Uh, and so last night, it was a long speech. It was, uh, you know, uh, this was an, a, a, an appeal to the people, but it went on for nearly an hour. And it was you know, an attempt to give the historical framework. And it referred back to his um, famous or some people would say infamous article in the summer about Ukraine and Russians being one people. And that argument which he's making it is a fair one. They probably just like Welsh people and Brit English are one British people in that view. But he's never said they should be one state. He's never said that. Um, so, um, that, that, so the speech was, again, yeah, basically, it's now an open declaration that we can no longer talk with you. The West, of course, has been piling on sanctions for year after year. So they're saying, and he actually said it in his speech yesterday, that, you know, OK, you're going to throw more sanctions at us. But, you know, we're used to it. Russia has been under sanctions since the jackson Vanek Amendment of uh, 1974. So and then a, when that was lifted, they set a new set, a new lot, the Magnitsky Act. So, you know, it, it's not going to end. United States has been opposed to uh, Nord Stream 2 uh, right from the beginning and any gas pipelines or any pipelines in Russia since way back in the 1970s. So it's as if the Cold War never ended. And on that point, Germany just announced that they are shutting down certification of the Nord Stream 2, at least for now, though it's not a permanent decision. So I think they've left some room for some room, yeah. some room open for that to be possibly reversed. What do you make of that decision? Yeah, uh, it's, you know, effectively certification was postponed anyway. So even before Russian actions, um, because they suddenly decided a couple of months back that uh, they had to have a registered office in Germany, as if they didn't know that really over the 10 years, uh, rather than the, uh, the, uh, the holding company registered in Switzerland. So uh, they wanted to put it in Germany. That was going to take six months to set up. So the earliest we could have got uh, gas flowing, even though it's physically finished, was middle of 20, well, maybe later, well into 2022. So um, this, the halting of the certification, you know, Russia has, has factored that in. But, you know, a key point here is to say that it's uh, the Nord Stream 2 is 2,000 kilometers shorter than the Ukrainian route. It's also far more... Uh, green, if you like, energy efficient because the uh, the Ukrainian pipeline system, you know, because the main Russian gas production now is in the Yamal Peninsula. The old West Siberian fields are largely exhausted or getting exhausted. Uh, so there's a lot of factors there. And don't forget, we in Western Europe are suffering an energy shortage. Our gas bills going up, uh, gas price has gone up nearly tenfold. So, you know, it, 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 we've already, before anything has happened, we're suffering the effects of sanctions. Well, and you raise an important point. There still is a Russian pipeline running through Ukraine. The point of Nord Stream 2 is that it just made that route quicker. But is that pipeline go going from Russia into Europe via Ukraine, is that going to still keep flowing? Well, yes, uh, because uh, um, U European gas demand is rising. Uh, as part of the green um, shift, uh, if you like. Um, so in the immediate future, it will decline later, but the North Sea gas fields are largely depleted or de production is falling sharply. The Groningen gas field is now being closed. So uh, Russian gas is required. So this was going to be, what, 55 billion cubic meters. Uh, and so Ukrainian pipeline, maybe uh, volumes would fall. But nevertheless, no one has been talking about it uh, being closed down, even though it's hugely inefficient and hugely polluting, by the way. And also, it just seems to it seems contradictory. You're punishing the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline ostensibly for Russia's actions in Ukraine. 
but yet everyone is still allowing this Russian gas pipeline to go through Ukraine, the country that it's supposedly attacking and, and undermining. Well, indeed. And in fact, uh, trade between Ukraine and Russia has increased lately. So uh, the point is that these two countries are, you know, organically linked, quite apart from the millions, literally millions of family links. I was just talking to a Russian this morning uh, and she said her mother was Ukrainian, her father was Russian and her babushka, her grandmother, was Belarusian. So, you know, it's, it's a constant, every, you know, every the people are mixed. And this has been the tragedy of the last three of the post Cold War years is that very deliberately, as we know, the Brzezinski strategy of the mid 1990s was to keep Ukraine and Russia apart. Well, that project has worked, I'm afraid, only too successfully. And that is uh, the tragic consequences we see of that policy today. Uh, the fear of a Russian empire being rebuilt, uh, which was a fear which didn't, ex you know, it was, wasn't based in reality. And instead of which we have this, uh, through NATO enlargement, this extraordinary sense of, you know, the grievances of people uh, under the Soviet um, heel. Yes, I, we can fully understand it. But the whole point was that we should have moved beyond it to establish a, a, what Putin said, an indivisible security framework. And that is what we failed to do in the post-Cold War years. So Russia has now sent in troops to these two new breakaway republics, Donetsk and Luhansk, that it's re now recognizing as independent. Russia calls these peacekeeping forces. The U.S. rejects that term. What happens now with these Russian forces there? What do you foresee them doing? Well, uh, I don't see them immediately moving forwards, even though don't forget that Always in these sort of alliances, you have the you're not quite sure whether the tail is wagging the dog. The, certainly, the the Kievian, the Ukrainian tail is wagging the U.S. dog quite a lot in this sense, and because it's entrapment, allies, and so the, the, we should never forget the subjectivity of the you know the agency of the leaders in the Donbass. Obviously, they're, 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 they're uh, effectively working with Moscow and so they don't have much agency, but they have some. So whether they're lobbing these, these uh, shelling and missiles over to the other side. What I envisage is that there will be a declared a 10 to 15, perhaps 20 kilometer zone around these republics where they say um, heavy artillery snipers and so on have to go back. So I don't envisage an immediate move forwards, but the Western talk of, you know, sanctions and endless measures, depending on how severe they are, uh, you know, Russia may feel, you know, to push forwards into, you know, I think it's unlikely, but because don't forget these Donetsk People's Republic and Lugansk one are only part of the former regions, the former oblasts. And so, um, you know, there may be a temptation to move forwards. I think it'd be foolish and it'd be quite wrong, but, uh, you know, there may be a temptation to do so. And to help convince the public that Russia is poised to invade Ukraine beyond even these republics, the U.S. has over the last several weeks now put out a series of claims with no evidence that Russia is planning false flags, including with cadavers. One of the latest ones is they sent this letter to the uh, United Nations saying that Russia has plans to round up people in camps, uh, including LGBTQ citizens of Ukraine. What do you make of these allegations? Well, it's uh, it's about as credible as the Russiagate allegations a few years back, and the intelligence is about as convincing, or the fact that Russia was paying bounties uh, in Afghanistan, or the fact that Saddam Hussein has uh, weapons of mass destruction. The idea of this intelligence, and this is exceptionally dangerous, because what we have at the moment, it's, it's not based on intelligence, it's based on guesswork. Basic intelligence, as uh, our colleague uh, Paul Robinson noted, for example, in Belarus, showed that the field hospital was well away from the border. I mean, we're talking about a totally irrelevant to a thing. So it's uh, it's these so-called intelligence briefings go to the media and run around the world as if they're fact. They're not intelligence, they're guesswork. You know, we've had the date the invasion was going to be the 16th of February, then it was moved and so on. Um, the British, of course, have joined the uh, the, the game. Uh, we're talking about the planned coup and the name the person Muraev they put forwards as the possible uh, you know, leader of a new government in exile is somebody who isn't even allowed in Moscow uh, and uh, who is and bitter at odds with the person working largely, uh, you know, the opposition leader, Viktor Medvedchuk. 
who is in, under house arrest. So uh, this, this, this is uh, part of a genuinely frightening disinformation and misinformation campaign, uh, which uh, is worse than anything, even in the first Cold War. This sort of absolute demonization and falsification of what is going on. Uh, and of course, it's, uh, as I say, uh, the Ukrainians have several thousand lobbyists in, uh, in Washington running about uh, far more than the Saudis even today or the Israelis, um, shaping the narrative uh, and so on. It's a very frightening um, situation where the, then the worst thing is these stories do shape the narrative. They're the headlines. I've been doing a lot of media interviews and immediately they pick up on the latest so-called intelligence rather than dealing with the substantive issue of how we got into this appalling uh, mess in the first place. So given that you have the series of uh, claims, it's like they have a new one every single week, the false flag. They're also, I forgot this one, there was the Russia was going to launch a coup and install some Russian friendly leaders. One of the people on the list of the supposed new coup leaders was someone who's actually being currently being sanctioned by Russia. And he laughed yeah, at the news when he was, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. told it. And this also coincides with a delay in certification for the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline and the Ukrainian government dragging its feet on Minsk. What do you think the goal of the Biden administration and Kiev was here uh, throughout all of this in, especially in Washington, having all these, you know, unsupported, to put it mildly, allegations come out? In, in a peculiar sort of way, alliance cohesion seems to have become the leitmotif of all of this. That is block discipline. The sort of block discipline we had in the first Cold War, uh, of course, France and de Gaulle uh, wobbled and so did uh, Ceausescu's Romania from the Soviet block discipline. But what we're seeing now is the phenomenon that uh, we're, everybody has to stick together. The 27 EU members every six months have to renew sanctions. Uh, and now, of course, Biden is committed to the NATO alliance and to ensure that uh, there's no uh, deviant voice in the solidarity. My view of this is that if you remember a couple of years ago, Macron said that NATO was brain dead, which was uh, obviously an accurate reflection. Unfortunately, this seems to have affected this disease, affected a lot of the Western leaders because... Uh, the, the aim now is to maintain their alliance solidarity rather than allowing uh, a rather more dynamic and fluid negotiating position. For example, Macron has come forwards with ideas. Schultz also said, look, Russia has security concerns, but they've effectively been smacked down. Uh, that discipline has been imposed and that we have this, uh, you know, endless. The British media is full of simply one story. Look, we're going to stand together shoulder to shoulder. Uh, the British, of course, boldly um, will fight for Ukraine to the very last Ukrainian, as in the typical British imperial manner. Uh, so it's it's a, a very strange phenomenon. In other words, they're not they can't deal with Moscow as Moscow. They can only deal as a block, which of course leads to the you know an, an intellectual exhaustion and of course a a, a very the death of diplomacy because there's no space. Macron and Schultz, to their credit, did try to break through. So I have to give them the credit. Of course, uh, this uh, escalation of Russia's yesterday and recognition of these republics is a very dangerous threshold. Russia indeed has crossed a Rubicon with this, with this. And we are now entering into a long-term period of open confrontation. And of course, you're going to add one point here, is that the background to this and the timing um, isn't quite accidental because, uh, first of all, the Olympics are over in Beijing. They ended on the 20th. Uh, and second, um, the joint statement of uh, the joint Russo-Chinese joint statement of the 4th of February showed that China and Russia are, you know, in solidarity. It's not an alliance, but it's a very close um, alliance. And then Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister at the Munich Security Conference in the last days, said, look, you should take into account Russian security interests. So this was quite an unusual expense. Obviously, China is not going to encourage separatism because of its own concerns. But uh, it, this was as you know, really quite astonishingly far. So we're seeing as part of all of this, uh, I mean, for me, as a European, it's an absolute tragedy because it means a division across the heart of Europe for the next generation. And, you know, we're talking about, you know, 
families being separated because there's, you know, there's, you know, Europe is a single community. I, I would go so far as to say Europeans are one people. That includes Russians, Ukrainians, of course, Belarusians, and all the rest. Uh, and the failure and the fact that we could not establish an overarching continentalist vision of the sort that Gorbachev had at the end of the Cold War. It was divided because of this obsession with Atlanticism, of NATO enlargement, uh, and so on. You couldn't make it up and to achieve this. Everybody said it from Kennan onwards, that if you push against Russia, sooner or later, you'll get the backlash. Well, sadly, we're now living that backlash now. For the last 20 years now, there's been a steady rollback of many of the arms control achievements uh, that were reached during the Cold War between the US and Russia. George W. Bush killed the ABM Treaty, the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty in 2002, 2003. At the time, June, uh, the Bush administration 20, said, uh, at the time, the Bush administration said that uh, the US needed to do this to help protect Europe from Iranian missiles which is still something that the Biden administration claims today, although I don't think any European countries, at least that I'm aware of, are very concerned about Iran bombing them with, the, with their missiles. Uh, then you have um, other treaties that uh, Putin called out in his 2007 Munich uh, speech, where he sort of demanded that the US end uh, NATO expansion. And he also criticized the US for abandoning Accords like the ABM Treaty and others. Then you have under Trump, you have uh, Trump killed the INF Treaty, which was a major Cold War pact that eliminated basically an entire class of missiles inside of Europe. And New Start almost expired before Biden saved it at the very last minute when he when he entered office. But you have you know so many achievements of of arms control being slowly rolled back. Even now, the U.S. is building a brand new facility in Poland for missiles. How has that background contributed to this uh, current atmosphere? Enormously. You're absolutely right. And you could add to the uh, death of these uh, co first Cold War arms control. The, the Open Skies Treaty uh, is another one that's gone. Um, uh, Under and, Trump. And, uh, Yep. So, uh, uh, so there's uh, the whole architecture has gone. And, you know, to his credit, Biden did um, continue New Start for another five years. Uh, and indeed, at the Geneva summit with Putin in June uh, 2021, um, they opened the door to a continuation of strategic arms um, process. We haven't got to talks yet, but suddenly. So it's sort of hanging on by its fingertips, uh, all of that. Yeah, But it's absolutely, that's it. Putin, in his 2018 State of the Nation speech, uh, specifically pointed out that all of this began with the US unilateral abrogation of the anti-ballistic missile treaty. Uh, they announced the leaving in December 2001 and left actually in June 2002. Um, so, uh, and he said, that's what the key thing was. And then we have these so-called, what we in Europe call a ballistic defense missile, ballistic missile defense, BMD, uh, ballistic missile defense with those two major installations, one in Romania, one in Poland, uh, which of course, Russia is very concerned that they could, this Aegis ashore uh, Mark 41 uh, missiles, cruise missiles could you know, be used for offensive purposes against Russia. Why? Uh, the, this, this the United States is so obsessed with these two um, missile defense installations. It's it doesn't quite make sense. Russia, of course, has responded by um, putting missiles into Kaliningrad, and thus we're in an escalatory cycle. So each one blames the other. Um, it, you know, it's it's exactly like um, the the comment of Theodore Roosevelt. Actually, I've just been reading it in 19, 1904 which says the Germans believe that the British are building up the Navy to attack them. So they're building up a Navy to defend against the British uh, uh, attack and so on. And well, both were wrong. And we're into, we're into roughly, um, well, I'd say, I think we're beyond 1904. We're somewhere like the uh, crisis of 1911 at the moment. So three more years, we are engaged in another march of folly, a march of folly in which all sides should take cognizance of the huge dangers because we now have the shadow of nuclear weapons over our head, which, as you say, the architecture which managed that. And of course, more dangerous with, um, that's why Russia developed its hypersonic missiles, the you know, fancy names, Zircon and all the other ones. Hypersonic missiles are, again, make the strategic deterrence balance so much more finely 
tuned, you know, the, the, the lead times of warning times to respond are shorter and shorter. So, you know, as people say, five, how many seconds to midnight? Well, it's pretty close. The doomsday clock. And I should correct something I said earlier. I said that Russia has sent forces in, into these breakaway regions of Ukraine. Putin has ordered those forces to be sent, but Russia says that those forces have not actually entered yet, at least as, as of the time that we're recording this interview. Correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, well, I, this has um, been um, a, a big discussion. I've just been listening to Al Jazeera and they were saying that Russian troops or the, the Kiev authorities were saying Russian troops are pouring in. But so I haven't um, heard right. the latest news. But, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if obviously some do go in, call them peacekeepers, call them what you like. But their goal will be to push back against artillery and other missile and attacks on the population, the civilian population of the Donbass. So um, that is clear. And if they don't do that, then clearly there, what was the point of the exercise? So, it, you know, it, it is, you know, clearly there's bigger, far bigger and other, well not bigger, but other issues in play, because that's important one, the human lives of nearly 4 million people. So the, the coup in 2014, and I know that term is disputed. Some people call it a democratic revolution in, in Ukraine. Russia calls it a coup. I think it's fair to call it a coup, given that you have a recorded phone call of Victoria Nuland, who was then working for Obama and now working for Biden, essentially selecting who the next Ukrainian prime minister was going to be while the Ukrainian president Yanukovych was still in power. And then he fled a few weeks later and then a new Ukrainian government came in. But I'm wondering if you could talk about how that background, for those who are not familiar with uh, Ukrainian politics and are just tuning in for the first time and trying to learn about the background that has led to this moment, how the events of 2013, 14, whether it was a coup or a democratic revolution, whatever you want to call it, have led to this current moment. Yeah, uh, the, the starting point, uh, as with many historical events, you could keep going back and back and back. I suppose the immediate term was the Eastern Partnership, which was uh, launched in 2009, uh, which effectively was going to be an association agreement between Ukraine and uh, the European Union, which, which is a good thing. I mean, it's for economic and other development in some ways, you could argue it had security implications. But when uh, the president uh, Yanukovych suspended it, uh, the ratification in uh, November 2013, uh, then we had this sort of uh, people gathering in the Maidan and uh, after many, you know, uh, violent events, which is interesting, by the way, the uh, truckers in Canada just recently, uh, you know, some rather, you know, perhaps you could argue malicious souls have argued that Maidan has come to Canada. That is the occupation of your major centre of your capital city for weeks and then months on end. And don't forget the Western powers said to Yanukovych, the, the legitimate government in Kiev, don't touch them, don't move in, don't attack them, leave them there. Well, it'd be very interested if they'd said the same to Trudeau and the Canadians now. Um, so, and of course uh, the events, uh, can I just say that the events, the, the people in Maidan, it was many movements in one. And the idea of a democracy to achieve a democratic and sort of a, a life of dignity was genuinely part of it. And I think we should respect that. The uh, men, women and children who went and suffered and stood in the cold uh, were have to be in their aspirations. They called it Europe, but of course, uh, let's just call it democracy or dignity. Absolutely. Right. But unfortunately, the revolution, as so often, was hijacked. It was hijacked by the nationalists. And of course, we know from various studies, the shooting in the last days of the Maidan occupation, uh, the 20th of February came from the insurgent side, the, uh, the right sector and others. Uh, and of course, there was a deal on the 20th, uh, which was endorsed by European Union foreign ministers, but Yanukovych respected it, the Berkut, that's the um, armed forces, withdrew, but it was rejected by the Maidan. European Union didn't support it. And uh, the 21st, Yanukovych was defenseless and basically left Kiev and, couldn't, and never returned. And a, a very strongly virulent nationalist uh, anti-Russian government took uh, power with, as you say, the endorsement of the United States because it was handpicked by the United States. Uh, and then even the best uh, attempt to, as I said, Poroshenko, we had elections of... Uh, Poroshenko in uh, May 2014. And indeed, he was the peace candidate, an old oligarch 
who knew the game, people thought, OK, he will sort it. Instead of which, he uh, launched an attack in the Donbass against his own people, the same as we said earlier with Zelensky. So uh, the Maidan did overthrow a legitimately elected president, however corrupt and odious he may have been. There was a deal for him to leave, and he would have gone by the end of the year, and we wouldn't have been where we are today. And when he rejected that agreement with the EU, the conventional narratives that he did so because he was corrupt and he was also bullied by Russia. My sense of it, though, is that he recognized that the terms of the what of the EU, what they were demanding in exchange for an economic association, were, were would basically have meant for Yanukovych political suicide because they were asking to cut the uh, pensions and energy subsidies that many Ukrainians depended on. Yeah, so the story is, is that uh, he allegedly hadn't even seen it uh, because there wasn't a version in Russian. Uh, so it was all in English and uh, French. Uh, he, so he didn't actually see it and the Russians organized a translation. And when he saw it, he says, good heavens, this is what I'm talking about. I mean, he'd been a committed pro-European and um, pushing for it. And don't forget that uh, Timoshenko was in jail, but then at the last minute, EU said, look, okay, you, she can stay in jail, just sign it. Uh, yes, Russia had been putting pressure on Ukraine from the summer of 2013, when Russian ideas, again, of a three-way trilateral discussion, EU, Ukraine, Moscow, to sort out the trade and other issues. As always, the EU said, look, it's got nothing to do with you, that is Moscow, even though Moscow's had hundreds of years of interlinked and trade and links with the country. Uh, and so it was, uh, I mean, massive overreach by the Western powers, the United States in managing the, or the, if you like, the coup, uh, and the uh, European Union in assuming that Russia is, it was just a vacuum in which they were moving, and it was far from a vacuum. And then the other narrative that you'll get about those years is that, so after, Yanukovych flees soon afterwards, Russia seizes Crimea, annexes Crimea. And then now what you'll hear in the US is, is said is that Russia recognizing these breakaway republics is just a, a new step towards him seizing more of Ukraine than he's already seized. Yeah, uh, this is a, a false narrative. I mean, why does he want to uh, seize Ukraine? Clearly, uh, any um, country would like as its neighbor a country which is not hostile and which is not going to then be hosting missiles and, and a uh, well a military alliance system which is opposed to your own security concerns. So yes, but seizing territory that was never the name of the game. And so it's interesting that uh, in the meeting which followed um, Putin's speech yesterday, uh, some uh, before that the Security Council meeting about two of them, two of the speakers, Nagushkin and another, actually made a mistake and said. Uh, the annexation of the Donbass and Putin said, no, no, we're not talking about the annexation, we're talking about recognition like uh, of the independent republics, and that is a similar status to Abkhazia, uh, South Ossetia, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, uh, and of course, in a so different way, Kosovo, which has been recognized by over 100 states, but it's in the US. Including the first, first of all, yes. Yeah. Yeah. When, when you try to argue, that the U.S. is being hypocritical and you point to the example of Kosovo, which had helped, you know, break into a separate entity and then recognized, or that the U.S. is occupying a number of countries around the world, including Syria and uh, including Syria, especially where it has no invitation from the government. That's not really an argument that you're allowed to make in, in the yeah. mainstream in the U.S., but I, but I think it's an important one. Yeah, they basically say, you know, these situations are different and they are. Every single situation has its huge etymology. Abhazia is very proud people before, um, and you know, and the Donbas particular history, absolutely, uh, and the Kosovo in its own way. So all every situation is different, but they are of a similar class, if you like. It's sort of just like uh, primates, all different, but they still can be categorized in a similar way. All right. So now you have to go very soon. Yes. So a quick question. If you agree that a major problem here is the U.S. and its allies' refusal to basically allow Ukraine to be neutral and in trying to basically turn Ukraine into a proxy on Russia's borders, 
what next? And has Russia attained any more leverage towards its goal of seeking a commitment that Ukraine will not join NATO and that offensive weapons will not be placed inside of Ukraine? How do you see this going from here? In fact, uh, the move of recognition could actually accelerate uh, the element. So they'd say, OK, we've lost this bit and Crimea, of course. Uh, it, it, how the West plays it, I don't know. The interesting thing is, is that we lack so many well, lack any serious states people, statesmen on the Western side. Um, the, the, you know, when, you know, a lot of com people compared, and I have with the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I think we've talked about it in that way. Then you had a Jack Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and endless other discussions, uh, um, back, you know, back channel discussions. Today, we have, you know, Biden has got his eye out for the midterm elections coming up. Uh, Schultz has just been elected. Macron has got an election coming up in a couple of months in April. So it's, you know, it's a very interesting uh, position. I don't think, I mean, Russia, I know the, the, the move yesterday of recognizing these things was not something planned a long time ago. It was in response to the failure of the West to deal and uh, act with their concerns. And these were part of the military technical measures that Russia had promised since the 21st of December. So, uh, and so now we see part of it. Uh, what the next part is, I don't know. And I don't think Moscow knows, but all one thing I'm absolutely sure of is that Moscow, sorry, Washington certainly doesn't know what is gonna happen despite its endless talk of intelligence uh, reports and so on. I mean, on the point about the absence of diplomats at a high level, I mean, imagine in the U.S. if you had a figure like George uh, Kinnan, who was, you know, a key eminent U.S. statesman who warned during the period of NATO expansion in the 90s that this would be a, a fateful geopolitical mistake. Imagine someone like that now occupying a top White House position. It's just unimaginable. Yeah. And in fact, the whole generation, a whole stack of people um, also in the US uh, leadership, William Perry and Robert Gates was uh, said that he himself understood it. But as of course, loyal servant, he does as the as he does as he's told him, as any minister should do, in a sense, in a cabinet government. But so indeed, there was a lot of voices. Now, there seems to be a headlong rush. Uh, the British leadership, uh, I don't think we need to go into that. Um, but I mean, this is why I do think that uh, Macron and uh, Schultz, the German and French leaders, really are the only ones, I think, who could start giving creative ideas. Um, but even they're constrained, as I say, by block discipline. Richard Sakwa, professor of Russian and European politics at the, at the University of Kent. His books include Frontline Ukraine, Crisis in the Borderlands, and his latest, Deception, Russiagate and the new Cold War. Professor Sakwa, thank you very much. My pleasure, thank you.